now. Yeah, I'll probably give you two minutes to be honest. I apologize. Okay, so Sharif. Um Sharif asked this. Hi, Pastor Tim. Can you offer some wisdom and counsel concerning imprecatory prayers, spe specifically from the Psalms? I've recently prayed in a way that would ask the Lord to bring trouble and even tragedy to my dad for the sake of him being saved. Was I right to do this? How should we best approach the Psalms? In general, I find an extremely difficult book to interpret, especially linking back to imprecatory prayers, and if we should pray them or not, and if they were only intended for the original authors of the Psalms to pray. And then he did follow up. Um, apparently, Sharif saw the, or listened to the um, Q&A that I did here in San Antonio, and I don't even remember the question that came up specifically, but I did deal with the fact that my own dad was um, somebody that I had to deal with. And my dad was an extremely wicked man. And he would blatantly dishonor the Lord. And uh, Sharif says that he listened to my, um, to my take on my own father and said that he was greatly encouraged Anyway, let's deal with that. Let's deal with it. Imprecatory Psalms. Um, let's, let's just look at an example of a couple of them so, so that we all have a good feel. Um, let's, let's look at Psalm 109. Psalm 109, and, and, you know, any of us that are familiar with the Proverbs, and I hope you are, or the uh, Psalms, rather, and, and I hope you are, because the Psalms, are, the Psalms are tremendous. The, the Psalms are unique in Scripture because they're so subjective, and, and they're they're personal and they show us that they don't gloss over. They show us, you know, the psalmist, they don't, they, they don't posture themselves. They're very transparent when there's struggles in their lives, they give them to us. Um, Brother Mac Tomlinson was telling me about a book that he has um, concerning praying through the Psalms. He said that that was extremely beneficial to his soul. I, I would encourage you to think about doing that at times. Just as you go into prayer, open up the Psalms. Now, I know that when you come across the imprecatory Psalms, there's going to be a check. Like, how do I even pray through this? How does this even have any application to my own life? Should I be thinking this way towards my enemies or God's enemies, or do I even have any enemies? Um, anyway, let's, let's just get a feel. Psalm 109, verse 2, wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me. So you see what he's dealing with. This is a Psalm of David. So we've got David. David is under inspiration, and he talks this way. This is God-breathed People are speaking against him with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate, attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayers, so they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. Now here's, here's his prayer against this person. He says, appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Now, see, we might think, okay, well, we're Christians. Shouldn't we be praying for our enemies? I mean, don't we find something somewhere, like maybe in the Sermon on the Mount, that we, we're actually told by our Lord not 
to do this, not to react this way? Aren't we told by our Lord and what you might actually, say, Brian? What's that? No, just go ahead. I think somebody will mute themselves by mistake. Now you've muted, you're muted now. Tim. Sorry. Okay. So that there's the tension. Aren't we aren't we told to pray for those who persecute us? And yet here's David, a man after God's own heart, and he's not praying good things for his persecutors. He's praying, he's praying, he's praying for the destruction. He's praying for evil to come upon this person. Let his prayer be counted as sin. I mean, David's not saying, you know, like we might pray, Lord, you know, when the wicked call to you, please hear them, cause them to call upon you. Lord, save, save wicked people. He's, he's actually cutting, he's actually praying for this guy's life to be cut short. May his days be few. May another take his office. Now, isn't that interesting? May another take his office. Now, see, as soon as you hear that, what ought to jump into your minds? That he's in Anything? A, that he's in a special position? Yeah, yeah but does, does that text jump out at anybody? It's about Judas, isn't it? Yes, that, that text is about Judas. And see, suddenly you begin to get this sense that, well, wait a second. Is this perhaps typology? Is this perhaps David? Yes, originally, but maybe I'm supposed to look past David and actually see the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that exactly what Peter does? Doesn't Peter look back at Psalm 109 and quote it in the New? Here's the thing that I want you to see. The New Testament never despises the imprecatory psalms. In fact, the New Testament quotes the imprecatory psalms. This one right here has to do with Judas. And you know what? If Jesus prayed this way about Judas, we know his prayer was answered. We know that it in fact came true. I want you to see another one. Look at Psalm 69. Psalm 69, another classic example of an imprecatory psalm, imprecatory prayers. As we begin reading this, um, where should we jump in? Maybe, um, I mean, again, th this, th what I want you to notice is this, Psalm 69, to the choir master, according to lilies of David. Here's a Psalm of David. Now, when you jump down to verse 9, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. It's basically the, the King James rendering. But again, this psalm is quoted in the New Testament as having to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Wow. That's quoted in, in Romans 15. Um, he keeps going here. What, maybe verse 19, you know, my reproach, my shame, my dishonor, my foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am despair. I looked for pity. There was none for comforters. I found none. They gave me gall for food or poison. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. I mean, this is, again, this is Christ. And, and then notice this. This, this is David speaking originally. Let their own table before them become a snare. When they're at peace, let it become a trap. 
Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. You see how he's praying? He's praying bad things to fall upon them. Again, not only does the New Testament not despise this, the New Testament quotes this. Does anybody know where this is quoted? Psalm 69, verse 22. I mean, if you've got a reference Bible, it tells you right there. It's cited in where? Romans chapter 11, verse 9. And you know who it's speaking about? It's speaking about Jews. It's speak. I mean, let's, let's jump over there. Let's go to Romans 11. I mean, here, here you have, let their table become a snare. Let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they can't see. Make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. In other words, Lord, let your wrath be upon these people. Certainly he's not praying for them. Certainly he's not praying for their good. And, th and then when we come over to the New Testament, to Romans chapter 11, what you find is the Apostle Paul, he, he doesn't say, well, um, you know, we need to ignore these imprecatory psalms because, you know, after all, that probably was an Old Testament attitude that we need to kind of just forget. We need to not think about that. Rather, he says in Romans eleven seven, 7, what then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it. The rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, hmm, where does David say this? Well, in Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23, where we were just looking, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. I mean, one of the things that you have to recognize about the imprecatory Psalms is they're prophetic. But what you need to recognize is these two Psalms, Psalm 69 and 109, classic examples of imprecatory Psalms. And yet, we find them quoted in the New Testament. We find that they distinctly have reference to Christ we find that in the New Testament, the New Testament is never embarrassed about the imprecatory Psalms. It doesn't look at them like, you know, oh no, we need to. Now, that doesn't undo the fact that we're called to love our enemies. That does not undo the fact that, that we should pray for those who persecute us. But one of the things that I want you to see is this. There, there's one of these Psalms that I think is especially helpful. Look at Psalm 35. In, in fact, we could have found aspects of this in Psalm 69 and or 109. We just didn't look for it. Well, I mean, I saw it there, but I didn't draw your attention to it. But I want to talk, I want you to get your attention really fixated on, on something here in Psalm 35 that I think is very helpful. Here, we have, um, you, you know, if you look at Psalm 35, verse 17, again, David's enemies. How long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the loins. I will thank you in the great congregation, mighty throng, I will praise you. I mean, again, we this you can see Christ here. Let not those rejoice over me who are wrongfully my foes. Let not those wink the eye who hate me without cause. They do not speak peace. Anyway, um, He's, he's wanting vindication, verse 24. Um, you, you, but you, you see, he's, he's saying, Lord, don't, don't let them do this. Don't let them get the advantage over me. If you go down to verse 26, let them be clothed with shame and dishonor. Okay, that, now that's imprecatory. When you pray for somebody, that they be covered with shame and with dishonor. 
But, but here's the thing that I really want you to see. Notice, notice verse 13. But I, now go to verse 11. Malicious witnesses rise up. They ask of me things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But I, when they were sick, now this is critical. You see, side by side with the imprecatory Psalms is also something else. But I, when they were sick, yeah, what, it, what happened? Again, we have a Psalm of David. David, what did you do when they were sick? He says, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother, as one who laments his mother. I mean, can you imagine this? These enemies of David. David says, I'm, when they're sick or when something evil befalls them, I put on sackcloth, I mourn, I fast, I act like I act like somebody who laments like the loss of a mother. I bow down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they did just the opposite. They rejoiced. Now see, I mentioned uh, the, the thing that Sharif was mentioning was that I talked to the church here about my own relationship with my dad before he died. And that there were seasons, I, I remember one night, I walked outside of my dad's house. My dad was a farmer and the field behind the house was, I, I believe it was freshly plowed. And I walked up to the edge of the field and I was angry. And I was praying, Lord, kill him or save him. I loved my dad. I, I, did, I wasn't asking God to kill him because I didn't love my dad. I wasn't asking God to kill him because I hated my dad. I was asking God to kill him because he so dishonored God. And I love the Lord, and I love the Lord's honor. And my dad was, he was saying the most wretched things about God directly, not just misusing his, his name and some kind of blasphemies or, or, or using the name in vain. My dad was specifically saying things about God. And see, I think, now I didn't, I wasn't thinking like that at that moment because I was thinking about the Psalms. But the reality is I was thinking that way because on the one hand, I love my dad and I wanted to see him saved. And on the other hand, I love the honor of God. And I wanted God to stop being dishonored by my dad, even if it meant my dad being cut off from among the living. But you see, now I, I look at at these imprecatory psalms, and I can see the same kind of thing goes side by side, even here. And like I say, we could have drawn out these realities from, from other of the imprecatory psalms as well, where you have this side by side aspect where you see the psalmist is actually, he is dealing with his enemies in a way that shows that He's seeking to be righteous in the way that he thinks about them and prays for them and his desires for them. And yet, it's like in the continuation of this conduct, then you get an imprecatory cry. Now, I just want you to see that. I want you, I want you to be able to wrestle with that. But when we come to the New Testament, Again, I want you to remember, the New Testament quotes imprecatory psalms. It, it's never critical, and it's never, the New Testament is not critical of the imprecatory psalms. The New Testament is not embarrassed about the imprecatory psalms. And like I say, many of these psalms, they point to Christ, and they point like to Judas and enemies of Christ and of God who... Um, who we see um, that the scripture doesn't have any problem carrying over into the New Testament. But I want to show you several things from the New Testament that have an imprecatory flavor to them. 
The first one is Galatians. If, if we look at Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5 is the most imprecatory chapter probably that Paul has written. And you can see it he, he says this verse 7 Galatians 5 7 you and he's speaking to the Galatian churches you folks in Galatia, you Christians, you were running well. Who hindered you? Okay, you want to focus in on that who? Somebody did that. Somebody came among the Galatian churches. And of course, if we read the rest of the letter, we see that that's exactly what happened. The Judaizers came, came among them. There were, there were men, maybe women, but there were actual people who came among the Galatian churches who sought to steer the people away from the simplicity of faith in Christ. And he says, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion, in other words, the teaching of these people, that's not from him who calls you. This isn't from God. This is, this is man-made or devil-made or both. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In other words, this bad teaching from these people is contaminating to the churches and to your ways of thinking. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view than mine. He's saying, I got the truth. They don't. And the one who is troubling you, there it is. The one who is troubling you will bear the penalty. Now that's imprecatory. You see, you, you, he's making a pronouncement that these people, these false teachers, I'll tell you this, he's not praying for their salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that, like Psalm 35, that there's times when he prays for them, even maybe fasts for them. But here, it's a pronouncement of judgment, that the one troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Like God, God plays no favorites doesn't matter who it is. But if, if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? What, what's happening is answering a question. The Judaizers were saying, hey, even Paul is preaching circumcision. And he says, no, I'm not. He says, if I was, why am I still being persecuted? In other words, by the Jews. I am an object of their persecution. Why would that be true if I was still preaching the circumcision? It's obvious that the Judaizers are saying, hey, what we teach, Paul teaches. And Paul's saying, no way. I do not teach what they teach. They're not teaching what God teaches, and I am. And they're going to bear their penalty, and they're leading you astray. And you can go back up to verse 4, severed from Christ. You see, it's being justified by the law. They're preaching works is what they were doing. Fallen from grace. This is... This is damning doctrine. And he says, I wish, verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Now, you know what? Our ESVs are modern. Our ESVs use language that they don't want to be overly um, offensive. <laughs> the reality is that most everybody, when you hear emasculate, you don't really feel very much by that term. Basically, I'm going to be graphic here. Basically, what Paul is saying is I wish they would cover, cut their sexual member off. I mean, he's saying, we're talking about circumcision. And he says, I wish they would mutilate themselves. I wish they would take, he says, I wish what happened with them, if they want to talk about circumcision, I wish somebody would lay the knife to them and just cut it right off. And you say, well, what? How can Tim say that? Well, just understand, Tim's not saying that. You need to understand, Paul is saying that. Paul is speaking in extraordinarily uh, graphic terminology here. And uh, 
Th that is an imprecatory reality that we find in the New Testament. Okay, I I'll take you to another one. And it doesn't always jump out at you exactly this way at first, but this is exactly what it is. If we go to 1 John, 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, we get something interesting here. 1 John 5, as this little epistle of John's is wrapping up, Verse 16, 1 John 5, 16. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death, I do not say that one should pray for that. I see, you see, we read that and we get perplexed. Hmm, what does that mean? And so you know what? We, we at first don't even know what that means. And so we don't even recognize that actually you have something of an imprecatory nature here. It's almost like in our confusion about what it means, we don't really recognize what, it, what, what is really going on here. here here's the thing. I preached through 1 John, and when I got to this text, I had to ask myself this. What does he mean, a sin that leads to death over against a sin that doesn't lead to death? Okay, I recognize this. Statements like this don't come out of nowhere. I recognize that there's, there's a fluid motion in our, our Bible letters. In other words, when you read Galatians, there's a purpose. Paul is writing one continuous flow of thought from the beginning of the letter to the end. He's got one primary thing that he's dealing with, and he comes at it a lot of different ways. But sometimes we approach scripture and we kind of have this idea, well, you know, there's all these kind of random thoughts. No, you don't want to look at scripture like that. The, the epistles are letters, and they typically have one primary thought that may be developed many different ways. We may look at it. it the author may take his argument in different directions, but there is logic to why these things are being said. John does not simply start talking about a sin that leads to death out of nowhere. This is not just some random arbitrary, hmm, now that I'm wrapping up the letter, I think I'm going to throw in a thought about sins that lead to death. Now, this has to do with the letter. You'll have to remember this. All the way through the letter, John has been speaking about people who are deceivers and people who are antichrists, and people who have gone out of the church because they weren't of us. And I, you know, when you, when you think about what is, like think of Hebrews, what sort of sin is there that there's no repentance and it leads to death? Well, we know in Hebrews 6 what kind of sin that is. It's where you were exposed to truth. You were exposed to the power of the age to come. You were exposed to the power of the word of God. You were exposed to the operations of the spirit of God. You were exposed to the truth. You were exposed to the gospel, and you walked away from it. That's, that's what Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 tells us. There's no hope. Or Second Peter. It would have been better for them to have never known than than knowing to then walk away like the dog that goes back to its vomit. Well, this is exactly the same kind of thing that we have happening in 1 John. You remember that, that teaching here about Antichrist. You know, if you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, children, it's the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. But many Antichrists have come. 
And see, these are the people and these antichrists we're told is these, these guys are liars. These guys are deceivers. You go over to, to 1 John 2, 22, who is the liar? but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. And, and he talks about the fact that these people go out from us because they were never of us. There's a, there's a departure. These people were in the church. These people were among the people of God. But then what happens is they went out from us because they weren't of us. And it seems like what John is saying is this. You get people in the church that are still among us. And you know what? We may have a fall into sin. Those sins are forgivable. Because that's exactly what is said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John 2, 1. I write these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. You see, those are... Those are forgivable sins, those kind that we commit, and we have an advocate with the Father, and he washes them away. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1 and verse 9. But you know what? If you come face to face with the truth and the teaching of the true Christ, and you just distort it, and you, you reinterpret it, and you walk away, that is the kind of thing. And, and you know what's interesting about 1 John 5? is it expects us to know. John expects us to know the difference between those who commit sins that lead to death and those who commit sins that don't lead to death. He talks here like we should know. Oftentimes we feel like we don't know, but he's talking to us like we should know. Brethren, I have a feeling what he's saying there is that people that we full well know came face to face with the truth and they trampled the blood of Christ and chose their and chose their sin over Christ i suspect that this has a lot of application like he's saying i'm not even saying you should pray for that I'm not saying you should pray for people who have walked away once they've been face to face with this amount of truth. Now, we always like to say, well, we don't really know when they cross that line. But isn't it interesting? John feels like we should know. And I think the truth is, a lot of times we do know. Brethren, I fear greatly for my daughter Charity. But do I recognize that there's, there's similarities with Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10? I'd be blind to say otherwise. I, I want to hope. My only hope is she hasn't crossed that line. But I'll tell you this. John expects that we should have some idea. And you know what he's saying? He's not saying we should pray for them. That's what he says. There is a sin that does not lead to death. Yes, we know that. But there is a sin that does lead to death. And he says, I do not say that one should pray for that. There are people, look, he's not talking about just praying for the sin. He's obviously talking about praying for the individual that has the sin. And Jesus used strong language. He called people snakes. He called people vipers. He called people serpents. He called them a brood of vipers. He called people hypocrites. It's strong terminology. Terminology that if we called people, we would be thought unloving. It's just a reality. The world would attack us. If, if we as Christians call, call people what Jesus called people, and, call, and say about people what Paul said about people, the, the world would say we're unloving. The world would, would accuse us, that, because they're so ready to accuse Christians. <clears throat> but here's the thing. I think you can see from these verses that there is still a New Testament reality to the imprecatory Psalms. 
And brethren, it, it is not wrong for Christians to feel anger, to feel wrath, to feel hatred, and even to have imprecatory thoughts when they seem to be inconsistent with the scriptures. I'll tell you, when you so love God that you become really outraged when he's dishonored, that's what Jesus did. Did Jesus, did Jesus simply go to the temple and, and get down on his knees and pray to his father, oh, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Isn't it interesting? Jesus could pray that way when people crucified him. But when they dishonored his father, he made a whip. And he went to whipping the people. And <laughs> if, can you imagine if we did that? If we made a whip and we started whipping people because they were dishonoring our father? And I see, I feel like this is the way. I, I, was not, I was not wanting to call down judgment on my dad because he was offending me. I desired that because he was dishonoring God. And, I, and brethren, I'll tell you, if, if you love your wife or your husband, you would become upset if people dishonor them, if people show disrespect. If, I mean, men, if, if you were out in public and somebody came up and spit in your wife's face and you felt nothing, something's wrong with you. And, and that's the feeling that we get in Scripture. And so, brethren, there's a right place to be angry. And there's a right place to feel, to feel hatred even. And, and, and yet, there is a proper place to pray for our enemies. And we, there's a tension there. And I'm, what I'm wanting you to do is just feel the tension. And I, I'm not going to solve it entirely for everybody. But, but you see it. It's not just Old Testament. And even when it is Old Testament, those Old Testament Psalms get they get quoted in the New Testament with no embarrassment, with, with no criticism. In other words, they're never looked at as, okay, now we're in a new dispensation where we have to disregard those. They were never told that. Yes, 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 we're told, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, yes, again, this is, but what you have to recognize is there's the difference between wanting revenge and when somebody puts out my eye, I want, I want their hide for it. See, that's personal, and that's, that's, that has to do with me. But when it has to do with the glory of God, you, you recognize, why is Paul so stirred up? Paul's not stirred up about those Judaizers in the Galatian churches because they were attacking him. He's stirred up because they were attacking the gospel and they were endangering the people of God. If you want to see one of the people that don't get a whole lot of mercy shown to them, look at what's said about false teachers in the New Testament. It's, it's that some of the strongest things in scripture are said about, about false teachers. So any, anything, any questions, any comments before we move on? I just, just like the actual term impregnatory, is it just, is it like a, a prayer of revenge? Is that what it, you know, cause the kind of term it's not really used today and what would be the best way to like fully just explain that term over than a di dictionary term? I mean, is it actually like more depth to that term? Like, well, I mean, you get the, you, you get the sense of what's being said. I mean, it's, it, brother, it's basically to curse. I mean, that's the idea. It's what you're doing is, you're calling down some kind of judgment or wrath or evil, ill. I mean, you're, you're calling down something that's negatory, uh, negative. You're, you're invoking a, a curse upon somebody. And so it's, it's, it's like desiring, desiring something 
bad to happen to somebody. And then that's the, that's the sense. I've been looking at uh, Pinahas, Pinas, Pinas in Numbers 25, where he picks up the spear and he kills these two people. And behind it, it says, because of you were jealous with my jealousy. Uh, and, you know, he gives him the government of, pe government of peace. Is that the same? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, think, I think it's a tremendous... It's a tremendous manifestation of worship from every one of us that we feel loathing. We feel some hostility rise up in us when we see our God dishonored. Something, <clears throat> something in us should want to take the spear or take the whip. Because in that, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect man. He is the perfect example of a man who who loved God and we see what he did and he made a whip and he drove the people out and we could have said, well, Hey, why didn't he, um, you know, if you're supposed to pray for your enemies and do all that, why didn't he, why didn't he pray for them? Why didn't he go in and, and admonish them? I mean, aren't we supposed to deal with, with, with our enemies, with gentleness? Um, isn't that what scripture says? And yes, there's reality to that. And Jesus often did do that. But at the same time, there is a place to have a zeal for God that's good. There's a place to have an anger for things that dishonor God. And, um, and you see it. I mean, we just can't get away from it. There is this tension in Scripture, and I think that we have to feel that tension. We have to feel the pull in both directions. And I think... I think those of us that have, have, have hearts that have been worked on by the Spirit of God, we do feel that. I mean, in the one sense, we have an earnestness for souls. We desire to see, we love the souls of people. We don't want to see people damned. But on the other hand, we don't want to see God dishonored. And so there's that, there's that tension of love, love for God and love for man. 